This is Startup Storefront. What separates the world's top athletes is not training, determination, or endurance. It's how they react to the stress and pressure in the game. And this isn't a simple mindset shift. It's bigger than that. We're talking about how their nervous system responds to the unknown and the unfamiliar. The longest nerve in the body is called the vagus nerve, and it's responsible for letting our fight flight reflex take over or turning it into play. Our guest today, Michael Allison, has become an expert in how this nerve affects our performance in everything from public speaking to athletic competitions. Through this, he has developed the play zone, where he works with coaches to help athletes manage their physiology when it matters most. In this episode, we discuss what Western swing dancers have in common with tennis doubles partners, how to recognize when our bodies are in a suboptimal state and regain control in order to perform at our best, and the application of the polyvagal theory in helping entrepreneurs make better game time decisions. All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Michael Allison, developer of The Play Zone. Thanks for coming on. For people who don't know what you do, give them a quick intro of, quick of who intro. you are, what you do. I am Michael Allison, and I am officially the developer of what I call The Play Zone, which is my unique application of what is called polyvagal theory, okay. specifically to optimizing our performance. And, and just without getting too technical or too boring, what is the polyvagal theory? It's been around for a little while, Dr. Stephen yeah. Borges. What, what's your quick synopsis of it? Well, let's do it in real time. Okay. Okay. So okay. here I am. I'm in a place I've never been before, right? right. We've never met. Right. None of us have met. I drove through a lot of traffic to get here, okay? So subconsciously, my body is reacting to all of these features that are uncertain okay. and unpredictable and unfamiliar, just like a player walking onto a tennis court, right? And reflexively, subconsciously, my body is mobilizing. What does that mean? It means my heart rate's a little more elevated. My breathing is a little different. I'm releasing energy in a different way. I'm releasing cortisol. Right. And so I'm having all of these bodily experiences subconsciously. I can become aware of them, but they're shifting and changing adaptively, reflexively, because this environment is uncertain. We haven't formed a relationship yet. Right. And so it's also reading if I had to go to the bathroom or if I had muscle tension or pain. So all of the time we're subconsciously scanning our external environment our relational environment, and our internal environment. But looking for threats more so, right? We're or looking for it... both. Okay, so that's what's unique this could about be positive mammals. or negative. Okay. That's what's really cool about mammals, okay. social mammals, is we, unlike reptiles, we can detect what's risky, but we can also detect what's safe, what's comforting, what's, and in particular, in relationships. And so that is really the theory. The theory is explaining that that's happening. Whether we recognize it or not, and what I've done is I said, well, the key to performance is to recognize that's happening, to meet the body where it is, and then apply resources okay. and tools to regain enough control of your physiology to support your intention, to okay. support your goals, to support your potential. And you work with, with high-class athletes that deal with these types of, I guess they could be traumatic events, but more so they're just getting a lot of new data that they've never seen before yeah. in a different way. Yeah. It might even be the same venue, but it's a different crowd. It's a bigger crowd, there's more television. You got it. The locker room's changed. And so in, in these moments, what, what are the resources that you, you, you guide them, you equip them with, or even some of their coaches with, to sort of get them to the, to the point of great. focusing on yeah. what they're great at? So first is recognizing it's happening. Okay. So I like to tell stories. Okay. okay, so here's a story, this is a true story. And this is a player who, at the time this occurred, he was about 85 in the world, men's tennis, okay? So I'm watching him play, and I'm watching him step up to the line to serve. And I could tell his body was not prepared to serve. Very, very tight. Breathing was different. Facial expressions were off. Body language not in a comfortable, safe place. And it was a pivotal game. It was that like three, four game, right? Okay. You know, okay. So <laughs> sure, yeah. games three, three serving at three, four or four five. Those are big games, big right? Games, so yeah. you could see it. We could feel it. And he steps up to the line, double faults, right? Now he's even more tight. 
more revved up and a little bit uncertain. Next point, serves the ball in, but very, very right. gingerly. Right. Guy clocks it, winner. Now he's down love 30. Steps up to the line again, double fault. Now he's pissed. Now he's really amped up. So what does he do? Tanks the ball like three feet long on the next point. Game over. Set was pretty much done. Okay. So I get on the phone with him, or actually I get on a, I get on a video call the next day. I like to wait till the next day. It's like, okay. Smart. Okay. So what, what was going on for you, right? <laughs> what was going on for you? What do you mean? I'm like, well, what, what was happening? What were you feeling? What was going on? Nothing. Felt normal. I'm like, really? So watch a little bit of video. I'm like, okay, does this look normal? Right. Well, maybe I was a little tight. Okay, so he's acknowledging. Like, Here we he's go. He's acknowledged. Maybe I was a little tight, right? Okay. And I'm like, okay, awesome. You're a little tight. So what'd you do? And he's like, what do you mean, what did I do? I'm like, well, did you do anything to try to kind of get loose? Mm-hmm. He's like, well, I just did my routine. So, right, that's what athletes does. I was going right. to say, athletes go right back <laughs> right to their to routine. routine. Okay, you so default. Okay, you're right in. So, the, right? Me- so the, 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 the they go mechanical. They go one, two, three. Yeah, like whatever. Right, right, right. So okay. his routine. So I didn't even. So I had watched this player. This is so fast. Probably to me. ten hours by this point. Okay. And I did not see a routine. That he, I didn't see one routine. Totally. Okay. It's in their head. So I'm like, okay, what's the routine? He goes, this is so, so he's, fascinating. He goes, well, I bounce the ball one time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. I bounce the ball one time yeah. and then I go right into my serve. I go, okay, so that's your routine. One bounce. He's, he's like, that's my routine. Yeah. Don't mess with my routine. Right. And I'm like, all right, we're not going to touch your routine. Touch your routine. Yeah. I'm like, okay. So you bounce the ball one time. Were you ready to serve? No, but that's what I do. Oh. I just, that's what I do. And I but go. he acknowledged he wasn't ready. Okay. He acknowledged, but. He didn't, that's just, that's just how he lives. So I'm not ready, but that's what I do. I've been doing it since I was eight. So I go, okay, we're not going to mess with your routine. You acknowledge you weren't really ready. So can we do something before you start your routine? He's like, great. What, what are we going to do? And then, so then we explore all kinds of things. So in other words, as soon as the point ends, or as soon as you're at the changeover, yeah. you're already beginning an awareness of where am I? Is my body in the right state to perform what I know how to perform? Oh, it's not. What do I do? Mm -hmm. Right? So now he has a routine that he immediately starts as soon as point is over. That starts with the walk to the towel. What's he doing with his body? How's he controlling his breathing? What's he doing with his posture? How's he walking? Where's he putting his attention? That's all the routine. So by the time he steps up to the line, he doesn't start that one bounce. Till he's ready, and if he's not ready, now he has another skill, <laughs> which is so rudimentary. He can just bounce it yeah. with the racket yeah. while he waits, yeah. right? And so, but that was so profound for him because he didn't even think there was any alternative than to serve even when you're tight. And yeah, I could you say, added to the routine without him even noticing that you. That's were right. I put to a routine, routine before yeah. his one bounce routine. But okay, okay. let's unpack this. So. I totally understand what you're talking like this is so it's hitting home we'll say but <laughs> but in that is what you're dialing them into like a level of awareness yes. is that okay that's where it okay. starts okay that's it starts where it there. starts and and so let's pretend there it's an exhibition match and no one cares and the routine is less important but at some point you know maybe it's set point or two years it's it's the big stage and so on yes. the big stage there's they're dealing with so much more nerves and so what you're trying to do is pull them out of the nerves and and coach them through having a, a sense of awareness yes and is it just adding time or is it is that so it's you're teaching them breathing exercises yes you're bringing them back to level uh through yes. through breathing as close as we can as close right? as you as can as close as we can get back the to how it is when there's no pressure when you're free okay. right when you're free you can hit that serve exactly where you want by this level. Yeah, right. For sure. By this yeah. point, thank you. By they the way. can put the ball <laughs> <laughs> by your level. They can put the ball exactly where they want. So yeah. the difference between when it's not going where they want and where they know they can is in their physiological state. That's what I'm showing. Is that it's because your heart rate's different, your breathing is different, your muscle tension is different, which changes the actual mechanics of your shot. It changes the speed and power of your movement, which is why the ball misses, changes finite motor control, changes all of those things. When you think about people who say they have like the clutch gene, do you think that's a real thing or or do you think they just have a heightened sense of awareness and can bring themselves back to level despite the stage? It's a great question. I think it's both. It's not that they have a gene. 
It's that their nervous system, their subconscious, for whatever reason or reasons, isn't reacting to that massive trigger that you or I might react to in the same way. So their heart rate might go up just a little bit. Their breathing might change slightly. Or they like it. Maybe they like it. Well, eventually they learn to like it. Okay. Eventually, that's the point. Is eventually, okay, yeah. eventually, like a Djokovic, right? Right. Right. What we see in Djokovic is we see normal play, not being enough of a challenge for him to mobilize enough resource to focus enough and to dial into what I call the play zone. Yeah. He needs more challenge to elevate his concentration, to elevate his mobilization the re- elevated heart rate to get into his sweet spot. When we break this down, I think about an athlete like Alex Honnold, who mm-hmm. free solos the, you know, El Capitan, uh, mm-hmm. all these incredible feats of athleticism. And he's been into a CAT scan where they've scanned his brain and put images up that are supposed to like cause like fight or flight responses. And in the CAT scan, they show like no, no real reaction. And I'm wondering, <laughs> it's, it's like he's, a, he's able to completely block out any kind of fear, which is how he's able to go up on these mountains without any kind of harness, rope, no nothing. Yeah. And I'm wondering how big of a, of a role fear is in this whole thing, as opposed to like all of the other minutia that's going on, like the uncertainties, the familiarities, like kind of scoping it out. Is, is fear an outsized player in this whole ordeal? That's a great question. And I'm not, I don't want to teach the people I work with, whether they're athletes or business executives, to detach from their bodily responses. So you put me on a cliff, I'm going to still have a bodily response. Yeah. But what I want to do is not associate that bodily response to an attached thought or belief or story that is, I'm going to fall or I'm not good enough or this is way too much for me. That's the difference. It's like, okay, I have this bodily response, which he is saying he doesn't even, when they test him, he's not even having that bodily response. Now that could be a history of detaching, Mm -hmm. which is not what I'm getting at because when we detach and we don't actually have bodily responses, the reason we want to keep those bodily responses occurring is those are feedback loops that tell our nervous system how to regulate our organs, how to regulate all of our internal systems. So it isn't a recipe for long-term health and wellness. I'm not saying that's what he's done, right. but I'm saying the way I approach this is you have the bodily response. Now you do what you can to regain enough control of that to settle down. And then at the same time, you don't attach a story to it other than, oh my God, I'm reacting to this. Like right. when I walk in here and we start, my heart rate elevated. Oh, interesting, yeah. curious, wow, cool. Instead of attaching a story to, now I'm gonna bomb or now I'm going to choke, or I better just barely hit this serve in the box because I don't know if I can. So it's not attaching a second level story. That's sort of second level. The first level, the primary thing is it's happening in the nervous system at the level of the brainstem. And the brainstem is making these immediate reflexive interpretations as to whether the environment is really safe, whether it's just a little bit dangerous, or whether it's like overwhelming and life-threatening. And when it's overwhelming and life-threatening, then we see actually the opposite. We don't see mobilization. We see shutting down. We see collapse. We see quitting. We see making excuses and feeling hopeless and wanting to get off the court, wanting to get away, right, or even fainting, passing out. So let's take this to the next level. So you're coaching somebody on this. They're becoming aware of it, which means they're becoming aware of probably if the other player is having a moment. Yeah. And, then, and then you have to, you, ha- you can coach your client, let's call it, yes. how to capitalize yes. on yes. the other. <laughs> That's a great question. No, right? that's great. Yes. And, and so, because if you're really teaching thought. them awareness, yes. self, that means that's they right. can now see they it. They can see it and feel it oh in the other. So, so the way, so when you look at it through this lens, right, typical scenario is each player comes out and they get mobilized. Yeah. They get anxious. It's almost like yeah. I coach a college team. 10 of the 11 players are anxious, okay? So it's pretty universal, highly anxious. And so what most people do is they take that anxious energy because it's just, if you just look at it as mobilized energy, a body preparing to fight or to flee, they turn it into attack. They attack and they get aggressive, okay? So if you look at it this way, so you've got two players coming out 
And if we're going to, I do it in a hierarchy. Attacking is higher than just defending or anxious. Okay. okay. So we have two players coming out. They're both anxious. This player starts attacking. This player can, with awareness, recognize, shit, I'm, I'm just anxious. I need to rise up and match this player. And if I match this player long enough, and this player doesn't have the level of awareness and the resource I have, he will or she will go to anxious. Interesting. And, then and if I stay the, here, yeah. they're going to collapse, collapse eventually. And it happens all the time. So right. you look at it right. when you're very aware and you understand this, you start looking at how can I manage myself? How can I climb this, what I call the performance hierarchy and get up into play? Mm -hmm. But even if I can't, fight is higher than flight. Attacking is more... Of an toward, indicator. Yes, than just defending. Interesting. And so now you're kind of here, and I can we can play this game, and I can see this player falling down the trajectory while I'm climbing. And then if they balance back, like, so then what will happen? It's really cool. So this player will start to fall here. They may even start to immobilize. And they, a lot of us intuit this. As players, you get this, yeah. right? So... So now what they do is they make a last surge and they get angry and gnarly. And if you know that, you this just so weather that. You, yeah. just, you just weather that because they're going to go there. They call this they're the... They're going to go there. So Brad Gilbert will call this the wounded bear. The wounded bear. The wounded bear <laughs> Makes part of, one last of lunch. any match. That's right. And of anything. Of, of anything. any relationship. Of and any it interaction. always happens. So let's say you're, let's, you're in a final. You're winning. You're up. You're, it's not close to set point, but it's approaching. The wounded bear will arrive. Yeah. In and you, you're saying even in you, in or e in either, yes, in either, either one of you, you but definitely the person point. losing. And yes. you, you better withstand that because yes. if you don't, the momentum will shift. And that's what I. That's so. That's, that's the word. The momentum. Yeah. Momentum to me is one player's physiology getting closer to the play zone, getting closer to comfort and safety and control, and the other players getting more defensive, reactive, suboptimal. That's momentum. How do you apply this to business? And so when you talk to business coaches, or let's, let's do this, even your business. And so as you have gone through this professionally, at some point you say, okay, this is working. I have enough clients or success stories. You know, how do I think about taking this to the masses? How do I think about solving this for, for high school players, professional level? How, you know, what made you want to start your business? That's a great question. So originally I was coaching the actual players and I was coaching the actual individuals. And that's great, but it's, again, it's a one-to-one -one impact. So in the last year, I started a coaching program. So now I coach coaches in this methodology, all types of coaches, international, this all over the world, and I do it through Zoom. And we do an eight-week intensive deep dive. It's a 30-hour course, and then we meet live as a group every other week, so four times, and then they have mentors throughout too. So I've taken about 80 coaches through, and I have about 20 of those that are now certificated and are mentors for the new group. So that's where I'm going. I'm going into spreading this out to coaching other coaches, whether it's a business coach, yeah. a sports coach, a psychologist, and any type of coach. How much overlap, or, or I, the real question is like, here we are on an entrepreneurship podcast, right? Mm -hmm. And we speak to a lot of authors also. And so we try mm -hmm. to basically sharpen all of our tools, mental mm -hmm. being the, the biggest it. one. But yes. entrepreneurship is basically, you know, you starting a company, you going into an abyss, and every day is a new day. That's every day right. is a new challenge. There's a lot of unknowns. A lot of unknowns. Yeah. I would say it's a all lot black. Of risk. I would say the whole thing. A lot thing. of risk. And a lot of risk and yeah. personal so judgment. Yes, and so evaluation, this, competition. What's your advice to entrepreneurs? Not, not so that are stuck, but like, is, is it a similar format where in tennis there's a moment? It's a clear moment. Here's my match day. I'm here. Yes. I've arrived. I know the moment's going to happen within the hour or two. In business, it it's, can happen. It's ongoing. You can get a letter yes, from a lawyer today. That's right. Or your or your board wants to lead, fire you tomorrow. You know, like what is what is the yeah. business advice you give people? Yeah, I think it's the same. It's just longer. It's more macro, not just micro, right? So just like I do with athletes, what they're doing on the court, just like what you're doing in your actual business, is is half at best of the full equation. It's what you're doing off the court. It's how do you take care of your nervous system and your physiology so that you can work in your business and be creative? Because I'm actually arguing that every skill component that is built into performance, whether it's reaction time for an athlete or whether it's problem solving for an entrepreneur or creativity, being able to think out of the box 
or forming relationships with others is all based on your physiology in that moment. So I look at it real simply. Off the court and even sometimes on the court, is my body in homeostasis? Like, is it safe enough I'm actually in recovery? Or is it now diverting resources toward even playing? That's still diverting resources. Or fighting, or training, or putting out fires, or writing this email, right? Like, okay. all of those are diversions from homeostasis. Okay. Okay, so most so protect of us... homeostasis, protect Well, it. most of us spend too much time totally. and energy and resource diverting resource. Low yield events. That's right. We'll and them. we're tapping ourselves out. Yes. And so we need to spend more time in homeostasis, yes. which is promoting health, growth, recovery, relationships, yes. balance, all the good stuff. And so that's just how I look at it. And then off the court is also a mixture of both. Off the court though starts with homeostasis, starts with more time and energy and an awareness of Man, I have been really diverting resource in my job or whatever it is or on the court, and I'm going to do what really brings my body into safety, comfort, calm, and ultimately connection. Is there a part of the program where you, you want to induce some sort of, like uh, something that comes to mind immediately, it's like a cold plunge, right? Nobody in their right mind wants to get into cold water. Yes. But there's a real mental... Uh, that's a transitory challenge. Okay. So that's so you, one of these. And okay. so that's, that's an opportunity. I call that domain general. Domain general. Domain general. In other words, you can take a cold plunge. Yeah. And you can lose your shit in that cold plunge. <laughs> or, or you can take a cold plunge and practice your breathing, softening your muscle tension, being present in the discomfort. Trying to get back to that homeostasis. Right. Even yeah. though you're not, but you're, you're building yeah. those resources. But it's still a temporary challenge. Yeah. But now you're actually building skill that translates onto the court, onto stressful environments, onto str other stressful environments, because right. the physiology is the same. Yes. Right. So an elevated heart rate, high blood pressure, breathing that's short and shallow, that baseline physiology out of that emerges all kinds of different things. It's not a one to one. Do you see what I'm saying? So like that physiology I have in the cold water might be almost identical to the physiology I have when I step onto the court or when I walked in here and started with you guys. Like, those physiologies might be the same. So I share a story, and, and when I had to give my first presentation of this, right? Like, so I'm presenting in front of a couple hundred people, but bigger than that, I was presenting in front of the scientist who I based all of this work on. Stephen. So what I, Stephen Dr. Stephen Stephen Porter, okay. So yeah. okay. I'm presenting, yeah, he's sitting in front row, right. and, yeah. and, and I have <laughs> devoured his work, and, and I consider him a mentor and someone I deeply respect. So he's sitting right front and center. And so I knew going into that, here I am, I've taken his theory and I'm applying it to performance. And now I need to perform in front of him. That's pretty right, bold. Right. Like, can I do this? Right? And so I knew in preparation that I was going to have a physiological response. I knew my heart rate was going to get going and my breathing was going to change and my voice would change and all of that. So I wanted to simulate it. So I did a virtual reality experience of walking the plank. So you can use VR experiences, and I, I challenge myself to walk this plank, knowing that would trigger a physiological response similar to what I anticipated that's it would. So and, that, and that's what a cold plunge would be. Yeah, like Got I it. take cold showers for that for reason. that reason. Yeah, right. Yeah. Or I'll go from my hot tub to a cold shower. Right. Deliberately for oh, can I regulate? What can I do? Because to me, from the physiological standpoint, it's the same physiology I'm going to experience stepping on stage you know when you were talking about trying to coach people to spend more time in homeostasis as opposed to expending all these unnecessary energies on tasks that are just going to drain you of your resources yes. it reminded me a lot of the 80 20 uh, training philosophy where it's like you have five heart rate zones zone one and two are are pretty easy zone four and five you can barely get a sentence in mm -hmm. and you know, the, the philosophy is that you should spend 80% of your time training in zones one and two because you are not are going to build up your aerobic system without taxing your body too much and expending all this energy as opposed to like what most people do is they'll go out and train and they'll spend most of it in zone three, which is this nether region where nothing really beneficial happens. Like you might get a little bit better, but you're not going to get the gains that you'll see if you spend 80% in zone one and two and 20% in zone four and five. And that's what I was thinking of when you were talking about 
having people spend most of their time in homeostasis because you get comfortable in that zone yes. and you can become familiar with it and almost like a grounding where in times where you are in stress where you are right. in an uncertain in environment five, when you're yeah, in four and five. you you have a much bigger foundation to fall back on mm -hmm. of that homeostasis and i just thought the parallels between the two yeah are are staggering in, yeah that's in a many good ways. that's a good parallel and, yeah. and and i would agree with you and i would so so i would say the the lower zones are really rest and recovery yeah right from this standpoint yeah. and and instead what we tend to do is we train harder so when we come up short, we just train harder, right? And, and that isn't the answer, right? And spending time in those middle zones, I agree with you. Like a marathon runner, yeah. for example, my philosophy when I train marathon runners is don't run slower than your marathon pace. Minimize that amount of time. Most of them slog long, long miles slower than their marathon pace. Well, marathon pace is not 50 it's, that's not four and five. For, the, for a high level runner. Marathon pace is still way below their, yeah. their highest level. So yeah. that to me is their one and two. Mm -hmm. Spend your time at or faster than marathon pace, right. right? And forget that middle ground. And that's what you're saying too. Like forget all of the stuff that's depleting and tapping my resource because we only have so much resource, mm -hmm. right? And also that familiarity of what is homeostasis? What does feeling calm feel like? Even when I'm outputting, yeah. what does that actually feel like? And you're essentially retuning your physiology. You're retuning your nervous system. So when someone's in, say, a match or a competition, what is it that you tell them to do if they are trying to get back to that homeostasis mentality? Is it like take a time out, use a break as, as an opportunity to reset yourself? Or is it something where if I'm in the middle of a, of a volley with Diego, can I recenter myself that quickly or is it something that i just need like a moment or two like after the point is ended i can recenter both it usually starts with the first way you describe where you do it when you have a break because yeah. it takes awareness yeah. but ultimately if you're doing this and it becomes your habit you'll be doing it during during the point you will absolutely be changing how you're breathing and it will start intentionally at first but it'll become habitual and you will change all that. Is so, it deeper breaths or what, what is it? Not necessarily. So, well, deeper meaning if you're actually breathing with the diaphragm, yeah. yes. Okay. We want to breathe with the diaphragm even if we're mobilized in fight, yeah. right? But that's not what's happening. So if we know that we're really highly mobilized, we can actually start to feel our diaphragm as we're breathing. That will absolutely, that sends what's called vagal afferent sensory feedback to the vagus, which then can tell the vagus to inhibit and slow the heart it's a loop so that's why diaphragmatic breathing which we've all heard about it's because of the vagal afferents the sensory coming back to the brainstem goes oh i'm moving my diaphragm i mustn't be in fight mode i mustn't have to flee right so that's really important but it's also it's the re ratio of inhale to exhale so real simply if we want to get more energy we lengthen our inhale so we can pull with our diaphragm but we can pull a big amount in and then we speed up our exhale. So if we want to mobilize, right? And sometimes you do. Sometimes you're too complacent. Mm -hmm. It's not always about calming. Right. But so, so I teach in longer ends and then still a full out, but it's quicker. Sure. So if you think of it like you're climbing a mountain, every time you breathe in, the heart rate goes up for all of us. And every time we breathe out, the heart rate goes down. It goes up and go down. So if I want to elevate, I'm going to take a longer in breath, a shorter out breath, longer in breath, shorter out breath, longer. I'm climbing the mountain. I'm elevating the opposite for calming. I want to take a long exhale. I want to take a long exhale and come back down, come back down. And if I'm feeling pretty good, I might make it equal. I might really still pull a long in, but might be four or five, and then a nice long out, but I'll stay equal because that actually optimizes, you've heard of heart rate variability. Yes. That actually optimizes the respiratory component of heart rate variability, which is called respiratory sinus arrhythmia. And that is what we want. You know how a tennis player, when returning serve, they don't stand flat-footed. There's a little bit of sway. That's how our heart rate is optimally. And the more that sways in relation to our breathing, that is I a see. sign of resilience. There's a rhythm. I was just in three finals recently at the tennis club. And what I hate about it is 
even even like in the morning i'll wake up and i'm fine i go through my routine of like coffee so i'm like instantly in my routine yeah and blah 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 whatever and then i get on the court and as soon as i get on the court my heart rate goes up heart and i'm like up. here we go <laughs> totally I'm like here we go totally. again yeah. i'm like okay you know what breathing Try. and then so, i sit and i like yeah i try to recenter myself and i i, yeah. I think i do a decent job uh-huh. but it's i still i can't get my body to forget and i don't know that i want to get my body to forget that it's a you know somewhat like I, I try to convince myself i'll go oh it's just a meaningless club match i'm like that doesn't work my body knows it's not that and then i just try to play all these funny games yeah. with myself yeah and then i just try to go okay this is we're just gonna have fun i'm like no no it's not fun to lose actually, right so that's <laughs> yeah. a fallacy oh, you're bringing yeah. you're bringing you're, you're bringing to light i'm so giving you my things. real my real no but or- <laughs> you're you're bringing to light so many things we think our thinking is going to get us through it totally not and true. that's what you just proved to yourself yeah. it's the same with that vr experience i knew i wasn't on a plank it didn't matter right. my body was believing a different story right? So that's really helpful information. So I go, oh, I'm really mobilized. And the other thing that you said, you said a couple of things that you kind of don't want to feel that way at first. And then you kind of went back and said, well, maybe I don't want to give that up. So if you start just looking at that as mobilizing your resources away from homeostasis toward playing, which it has to do, Mm -hmm. right? It's just you've made some association that that feeling, that elevated heart rate means, oh, I need to calm it down. Right. And and it could, but it also could mean, oh, I'm just I'm just getting ready here. Right. I'm going to it's going to calm down. It's game time. Right. right it's game time. And it's going to calm down as I start using it. Right. right. Which is what the warm up is for, too. So, like, for me, warm ups are to actually, you know, we talked about this up and down. Warm ups are about getting elevated and calming down, getting elevated, calming down. That's part of it. And then the other part of it is getting familiar, getting the feel, getting everything feeling quote, safe and in your control, so the body will naturally calm down too. But it's ready to elevate. You know, it's like a dog. We were talking about dogs can lie there and jump up and sprint. That's essentially what we want to be able to do. And that's actually a physiology. That means when we're lying there, we have this heart rate variability like this, okay? And it's just, it's beautiful and it has a nice, goes up maybe, maybe if your resting heart rate is 60, Maybe actually, if you slowed it all down, you'd see that as you're inhaling, it goes up to like 80. Yeah. And then as you're exhaling, it goes down to like 40. Like that's beautiful. And so then what happens, that first burst, all it is is it's, the, it's called the vagal break. It's the vagus, the ventral fibers coming off and allowing your natural, your natural heart rate is 20 to 40 beats higher than your resting heart rate, like than what you see it. That's all vagally controlled. So in, initially, all that happens is the vagus releases the brake, and you can poof, you can use that heart rate variability. It's called vagal efficiency. And the more vagal efficiency we have, the more bang for the buck we get for that heart rate variability. And that's awesome. What are some other examples of, of like the cold plunge that, that you tell your, your clients or your coaches Well, breathing, to... different breathing routines. Okay. So that's where, the, for me, the Wim Hof method yeah. is beautiful. It's going to bring him up. Right. Yeah, yeah. no, for, for me, the, the whole idea of hyperventilating for like 30 breaths and then doing a long breath hold, if you look at it from the nervous system standpoint, the hyperventilating is either being anxious or in fight mode, okay? And then the holding the breath is that shutting down. So you're teaching yourself in a context of your own safety and control that you can ramp up and you can go in even into a mobilization without it being threatening, without it being dangerous, without it being something you can't regain control of. So I love that too, for, from that standpoint, even just intervals. Yeah. So like in the gym, I'll do high interval training, okay. but with nasal breathing only. So how hard can you push it still only breathing through your nose can you keep your face relaxed can you keep yourself relaxed while you're doing a full out sprint right and so that's one way or deliberately go to where you can't and then immediately stop and how quick can you get back to recovery how quick and recovery is not just lowering the heart rate recovery is softening the muscle tension throughout the body right so those are ways that i do it i do it mostly through movement Okay. But you could do it with anything. The VR the experiences VR, I was say are the, beautiful because yeah. you can do all kinds of different things. In business, it's hard for me to disconnect, let's say, tennis and business in a real mental way. But for, let's say, the business people who are on planes and in meetings all the time, and they're like, I can't go to the gym. 
and I don't have a cold plunge. What a, the VR yeah. thing's a perfect the example. VR thing's probably. great because you can take it anywhere. Right. The breathing is perfect for that. Doing right. breath holds, even okay. when you're walking. So like I'll do breath holds too because that's a similar thing. So like as you're walking down the street, after an exhale, always after an exhale, after an exhale, do a breath hold and, and pass that first urge. And then when you get that real urge, can you regain breathing without losing control? Plus, it's doing another thing. It's building up your tolerance to carbon dioxide, okay. right? You, you may already know that. The reason we take an inhale isn't because we need oxygen. Right. It's because we need to lower our carbon dioxide, okay. right? And so the more sensitive we are to higher levels of carbon dioxide, the quicker we trigger that breathing, the <sighs> blowing out the carbon dioxide, which from the body's perspective means threat, danger. You see where I'm going? So like if we have... If we're very sensitive to carbon dioxide building up in our blood, we will start breathing more rapidly. We might even open our mouth to breathe, which then internally is a feedback loop to the brainstem that says threat, danger, you're under attack, which creates more of that breathing, which creates a feedback loop that sustains higher mobilization. Whereas if we can train ourselves to get not very sensitive to raising carbon dioxide, we don't have that internal cue of danger. What I love about what, you, what you're working on is it's a one size fits all in some way, right? And so like anything could be happening mm -hmm. to me in my personal mm -hmm. life. I mm -hmm. could be on the court. The umpire could have made a bad call. It really mm -hmm. doesn't matter what the vector no. of something no. trying to throw me off my rocker no, is. No, exactly. They're goes, all just challenges. <laughs> they're all, they're, just, they're all challenges. just challenges to your body's sense of safety. Right. When you start seeing that, then you look at the tennis court or you look at your MMA, you look at your business environment as just a microcosm for life. I think about like real estate development, which is what I do. And it's like riddled with, I mean, in LA, you might know the, the politics are on fire at the moment. And so, you know, that's a big part of what we do. And the nervousness doesn't come from the property or the construction or the funding or, you know, this, this, the debt environment we're in today. It really just comes in, in the form of, can I get these politicians, whoever they might be in that moment, without a leak, <laughs> you know, without something ruining this moment? And that's that's the ground that I play in. I don't mind it because a part of me, it's it's the strangest thing because it, you have time. You know what I mean? It's like a really strange thing. And so somehow in this, I think people look at what I do or developers in general, like it's a very, there, there's risk. It's riddled with risk everywhere. It's you're betting on the business. You're betting on all of these factors to go right. But for me, it's always, it's the politics that, that can but throw you, this You thing. said something interesting. You said there's time. There's time. Exactly. So you can't have time unless you feel safe enough for whatever reason or reasons. Yeah. It still feels safe enough to you that you can slow up the time. Yes. Right. Whereas that's a really good indicator when we're under threat, everything's, everything's coming at us quickly. It's the same thing like in Nadal, tennis. Nadal yeah. just talked. Did you hear Nadal's quotes? I did. And I he did. was talking I about did. everything was fast. I couldn't <laughs> yeah. keep up. It was like, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, that he was under threat the whole time. Yeah. We haven't seen him like that in a long time. And that's what happens. And you're saying to me that you still, no matter what, for whatever reason, you feel safe enough and in control enough that time is there. You see the time. And that's what, like... For me, the biggest change in all of this is now if you, if you fail or if you blow it, you can relate to it differently. You can relate to your failures. You can relate to your mistakes. When you, when you interact with somebody that doesn't align with how you actually care about them, you can go, oh, well, for whatever reasons, I was either in fight mode, flight mode, or shutting down. I wasn't in my safe space. Now, that doesn't make all behavior acceptable. It's not what I'm saying, but it means how we relate to repairing that with the other and with ourselves right. is a whole different experience. Right. If you're, if you're not on the right, on the same page with your spouse, as an example, right. You're or feeling if, a threat to, is yes. to what you're saying. And so then you're reacting in yes. fight mode. You could, you could, or right? you could be flying and getting out of there. Or, or, right. <laughs> or you're you're right. Any of that. Yeah. So it changes right. so you, how, it, just like we were looking at the totally. momentum shifts. Totally. It's the same way when you begin to interact, especially with those you care about. Totally. Right. You yeah. become aware of where you are and 
hopefully where they are and you meet yourself and then you meet them. I love this. How are you going to change the world? What are you going to do? You got to write a book. Idea. What are you going to do? I, I, What's going on? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm going to start with, I am going to write a book. I have, I, yeah, I already I wrote, you do. I, I already wrote a <laughs> tennis book. I just need to polish it up. Okay. Um, I followed this one particular player for a little over a year and I wrote sort of stories about all of his matches, but all from this language. I'm making presentations now, so I'm going to be presenting in March in London, outside of London at the Elms. There's a, a big educational summit. And then I'm speaking actually at Oxford University. Oh, amazing. Oh, congrats. Crazy. Yeah, That's amazing. Crazy in September. Dream come true. Dream come true. Are you going to do so, the VR plank before you do that? And I'm going to. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to find some other ones because the VR thing I, I can, I can you, handle now. I actually don't have much of a physiological response, which is what happens. That's fascinating. So then you need to find something else, I'm guessing. Yeah, that, that or what, that. that's what will happen with public speaking, yeah. right? That's what happens, but it could go the other way, right? Which is what I talk about in some of my talks is, see, for like Naomi Osaka, it went the other way. For, for Naomi Osaka, her experience on the court when she won the U.S. Open in 2018, and it was just this crazy scenario, she took the cues that were coming really at the referee, for penalizing her idol, Serena Williams, her body, again, it wasn't her brain. It wasn't her thinking. Of course, they weren't directing it at her. Right. But, but you could tell by her reaction yeah, the hat down, that, the that her physiology yeah. took it as though she was to blame for her idol losing. And ever since she's been on this trajectory of moving very quickly, she doesn't fight for very long if you watch her matches. And she goes into flight very quickly and then she shuts down. And then that starts off the court too. And so that's also a dream I want to get with Naomi Osaka. Yeah. Once she understands what's really beneath it, it's not a thinking issue. It's not gonna, like her changing. But you're saying it's the awareness of the fight or flight. It's the awareness of how her time. body has changed. And right. now it's gonna, it's, it's all about helping her body, her nervous system feel safe again, feel calm again because it doesn't. You can tell by the tone of her voice, right? So we didn't talk about it, but our tone of voice and modulations mm -hmm. portray and broadcast whether or not we feel safe or unsafe. And so if, you've, if you're interacting mm -hmm. with someone then they have very flat affect, right? There's no movement in the upper part of the face, right? That's a cue back that they, for whatever reason, don't feel safe. Are there any other athletes in, in other sports that you're, you're looking at as well? Like you, you mentioned your wife was a triathlete. Are you looking to expand? Yeah, I mean, I have, I've worked a little bit with baseball and softball. Yeah. I've done some with basketball um, and volleyball. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the sports and, and team sports are really cool because the team can become, for better or for worse, really, really helpful or really, really harming each other's performance. And if they, if they have this level of awareness, they can help match each other where they need to be and lift, yeah. right? And so even if two players are really, really locked in that flight mode, they could come together and fight. It's a lot easier to fight, which is from my performance hierarchy is higher up than staying in flight. And as a coach, that's another thing that I, I like to do is as a coach, imagine looking at your basketball team, right? and you could see what zone each guy is in. And ideally, you get everybody together in a zone, but it might not be happening. But you would know, you could start subbing, not just based on what somebody's doing, but where are they? Yeah. And you could start cueing That's players crazy. in different ways, depending on where you see they are. If you have somebody in flight, what you might do to help them get into fight or yeah. get into play is different than somebody who's shutting down. So to so. break it down even further, we talked about individual routines to get back to that homeostasis. Are there team routines that, really, that people really can could do? Be. That's a great, great concept. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. Because all of, all of our routines, all of those kind of resources that I'm teaching, like breathing, like posture, like movement, like where you're putting your attention, when you do it with another, especially a trusted other becomes more powerful yeah. because if you go all the way down to the core of what's beneath all of this, it's a body that has a biological need to feel safe and connected and to belong. 
to belong. And so if you can get everyone on the team. You can get everyone. Yeah, it's a great. Uh, thanks for bringing this up. So those tennis players I was talking about, these this tennis team, Division One team, two guys are in the top 50 in the country, right? Men. And I got them in a circle, one by one, to share kind of really what they're feeling. And they were all anxious. And then it progressed, okay, we're really anxious, even more anxious when we're better than the other guy, <laughs> when we know we should win, okay? <laughs> yeah, so get this, right? So it keeps going. Okay? So then I go, Aye. well, how do you hear the, who, 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 where, and all our coach is telling us, or so-and-so is telling or us. Or UTR. Like, right, or, exactly, or they're looking. And yep. I'm like, okay, okay, so now, quote, you're better than the other player for whatever reason, and you lose to them. What does that mean? And so they go around, they're like, well, it means I'm, I'm not as good as I think I am, or maybe I'm getting worse, or and then one kid finally goes, it means I'm not good enough. And I was like, yeah, okay, now we're getting somewhere. Not good enough for what? Not good enough to be on the team. And so basically every one of those guys acknowledged to each other that in the end, what's really down there at the core is not belonging here. So think about it. So that's what it comes down to. So when you can actually acknowledge that, that frees up a lot. Because then you go, yes, of course, my biology wants, like I show up here today, I want you to respect what I do because I want to belong. I don't want to be left behind. Of course, so my body is going to respond. And so now I just play with it. I let it go. Okay, it's, it's doing its thing. Yeah. And let's just keep trying to find what's safe, what's reassuring, right? Which is your expressions and, your, and you being into it. That's a giant cue. Yeah. To me, of yeah, just curious. Let's go. Yes. Like, cool. <laughs> exactly. So, but that's happening yeah. on every stage. Okay. So then they admit this, and then where do you take them there, right? So, so now that we've admitted that our fear is getting off the team and probably losing community, and yes. who knows? I mean, there's twenty thousand things a college kid is going through. At Absolutely. That age. So, what that yes. means to them in a social construct and everything else. But where does that get them then? And so it's almost like they've acknowledged. They've acknowledged the kernel. The kernel. And then and then you go, okay. Now we go back to what we're talking about. So now let's just recognize those bodily responses. Let's meet the body where it is. And let's start doing off the court, the homeostasis. Let's just start building that. And, and then when you completely implode, it's all coming from that fear of not belonging. That's okay. It brings you back. You can recover. It's like, it's like the person on the diet. And they eat the one donut and then they eat 10. And then the next day they just keep going. No, this goes, oh, I ate the donut. I even ate 10. I was just completely unsafe. I was out of it. Correct. Come back. Same kind of thing. So it's not going to fix everything, but having that. And also yeah. now when they feel like they're failing, they know that the number one player on the team still feels the same way. Mm -hmm. That, that change, they're not alone mm -hmm. in how they're experiencing failure or how they're experiencing how challenging this is that puts them level that's the other part that I wanted them to get to is I wanted the the players that were further down to realize actually I'm level the number one player on the team still feels the same way I do he's still afraid actually so I'm actually not that far so yeah. it just levels it out you're bringing me back to the final I played in. It was, <laughs> it was like when I when I dug down at why I wanted to win. Yeah, it was had nothing to do with me. It was just because everyone here needs to know. Yeah, you know, it was one of these yeah. things. Yeah, yeah. Because what happens is when you win, they put your picture on the wall. Yeah. And here's a funny story. So my nephews <laughs> are walking by, and my wife's the Open champion. So they're like, "Oh, Tio Talia's on the wall." They're like, mm -hmm. "Where are you?" Mm -hmm. and I'm not on the wall. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you like, just want to be good I got to get on, on the wall, wall for yeah. the nephews, you know? Yeah, totally. And that was it. That was, it's yeah. the weirdest, oddest motivator. But it but, was but it, but it, honest. Right, yeah. but it's honest. honest. And, and that again, it. It, and that's meeting your biology. Totally. Have you thought about starting like a, even just a video series, a, a quick quick interviews? On, yeah, you know, actually. Because obviously you yes. work with a lot of amazing people, and so it's almost like, all right, this match or this day, this fight, this whatever it might be, yeah. but it's you know it doesn't have to be a long conversation, but could just be a moment of a almost like the detail, the detail, um, the show that Kobe did where he talks about yeah. what's happening in real time, but this is the angle is a little bit different, right? It, it's, it's that's more a great, of a mental That's a focus. great idea. Cause I started just recently doing videos of people in different disciplines. Yeah. Like I'm doing one with a Western swing dancer because when you look at Western oh, swing, Western, Western swing, Western swing dancing. Okay. 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 I didn't know anything about this, but the way the, right the, thing, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the way the competitions are, is basically you have like five ladies and five men. They don't know each other. They're all quote at the same level. Okay. 
And then they spend a couple minutes with each partner. So imagine you don't know this person and it's all made up. It's not like you're doing the waltz or the foxtrot. It's all on the fly. So the, the lady has to follow the man and think of if a man is completely afraid. And now you, so think of all of this from this lens. So when she was telling me about this, I'm like, oh, I'm going to, I got to interview you and frame it in what's going on in the nervous system, in the body, because it's fascinating. So I started doing that. I started doing those sorts of things because that's fascinating to me. Like all, all of these different disciplines, when you look at it through this lens, oh, that's why that makes sense or why this is so challenging. Like to me, that Western swing competition neurologically is as challenging as they come. You're being evaluated by judges. You're meeting a new partner every couple minutes. You're making up a dance you've never done before. And you have to do it with this partner. <laughs> Think about it. At least on the tennis court, That's you're hilarious. you're in control of you. Right. You're, yeah. You got the opponent throwing more uncertainty at you. But imagine that, a partner you've never had. You've played doubles before with someone you've never had. Yeah. And how tricky that is. And now every couple minutes, you have to switch to a new partner. And I you have to play. I got a YouTube this. This yeah. is fascinating. Now, so, yeah. So I've been doing stuff like that. Idea. But what you're talking about is cool, too. Where you actually talk about experiences, right? Like, yeah. what was really going on for you. Good or bad, and, right? I mean, right. That's oh, absolutely. The thing. And probably absolutely. more bad so more people bad. understand that it had less totally. to do with performance and more to do with the thing that no one can actually see but yes. is being felt, and which is, yeah, I think that's, that's, just that's really it. cool. Right. You can feel it. Yeah. And that's what we all feel when we're watching. Yeah. Right? And that's part of what you need to acknowledge too is you're, as the player, you're feeling what the audience is feeling and vice versa. They're feeling what you're feeling. Michael, where, where can people find you? Where can they? Uh, they can find me on my website, theplayzone.com. And I'm in Santa Barbara, California. Yeah, happy to jump on a Zoom call. Happy to give a talk. This is great. This was really informative. Topics. Yeah. Thanks no, for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate you guys. it. Yeah. yeah, you guys are awesome. I really appreciate it. If you made it this far, I bet you loved the episode. So you should join our YouTube channel membership for only $2.99 a month. This gets you access to one, the whole unabridged conversation. Two, you get the episodes on Monday, one day earlier. Three, you get two additional entries to our giveaways. Check out our Instagram to see what we've given away. And four, you get access to seasons one through three. That's over a hundred episodes of wisdom and life-changing advice. What are you waiting for? Join.